I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this week's episode of the podcast. This week I'm speaking to Nick de Rothschild, President of the Noreen and Amaryllid Society and of Exbury Gardens in the New Forest. The gardens at Exbury play host to a huge range of plants, providing interest throughout the year, but one of the jewels in the crown is the collection of Noreens. There are many types of Noreens planted in the garden and an exhibition is currently underway of one particular species, Sarniensis. If you're not familiar with this species, I've posted some images from my visit on the Roots and All social media, and I hope you're as blown away by the otherworldly beauty of these flowers as I was. I started by asking Nick about the different types of Noreens grown at Exbury. We grow Noreen sarniensis as a main crop, and then we grow some Bowdenies and some Amarines and... We have quite a few species nereens as well, but they tend to be much smaller and more delicate flowers than these. These are these are the most spectacular, really, of the nereen family because they have so much colour in them. The variety of colour is enormous, but never yellow. Ah, oh, that was one of my later questions. So, never been achieved? Will it ever be? No. Um, the only flower that looks like a noreen is a lycoris, and they're yellow. But noreens and lycoris is a divergent genetically, so that they do not cross pollinate or do not breed. So no one has managed to get a yellow noreen. And you breed them here? Oh yes. Well, they breed themselves here. We acquired the collection from Sir Peter Smithers in the 1990s and he had acquired the Exbury collection in the 1970s and he decided that he would breed the finest Noreen Sarniensis in the world which I think he'd managed to achieve but after a while well first of all he used to name some of his new hybrids for his friends and then he got hold of a Microsoft computer program called FoxPro And he put all his Noreens onto his database. And from then on, he managed to complicate the issue of Noreen breeding to such an extent that we could not keep up with it. And we started all over again. Well, the principal reason why we started all over again was because when we picked up the Noreens from his house in Switzerland, we had a little truck that had trundled all the way across the Alps that had arrived at his house and we arrived there and we loaded all his Noreens into the truck in layer upon layer. Um, What we didn't realise that he kept his collection numerical. So when we, after the week that it took for the little truck to come back over the Alps, um, we unloaded it into one of our old greenhouses but we didn't realise it was all in numerical order and thus the numbers were lost other than on the um, database and that was quite difficult to work out so we decided to renumber the whole lot um, and we did that based on what we perceived as the quality of the flowers that we were seeing and then we decided that people thought that 2347B crossed with 301 crossed with something else um that should have a name and we decided to name all the noreens and we started off with the pink ones became girls names or ballerinas the mauve ones became egyptian pharaohs the ones that were sort of lava colored hot colors like that became volcanoes the dark reds became um men who sometimes were rather evil and were often you know African chiefs who like Shaka Zulu or Kilizazi or whatever we had great fun Theo and I naming all the ones that Sir Peter hadn't named and then 
in the collection that we got from him were lots of his hybrids that had never flowered before. And so we had the great joy of watching his hybridization program come to fruition and there were some absolutely spectacular hybrids that he'd never come across and we had great fun naming them i think one of the best ones is flowering at the moment over on the other side of the exhibition is prince of darkness it's a fabulously dark red do do they take a while to flower then well from seed to flowering takes between three and five years what happens now is when we bring the nareens up to the exhibition, we push them in a little trolley or on a little trolley and their stems wave around and um, behind our backs they're having sex and they're making babies. So we collect the seed from the female plant and put that on the label that it comes from there so we can sort of detect aspects of what that flower is. But the male plant could be a bee, it could be because they touch each other in the exhibition or on their way to the exhibition. But frankly, we've got so many different colours that what we do is we look for good ones. And when we spot a good one, that then goes onto our look-see bench. And if it multiplies up because the bulbs split over the years if it throws enough babies then they get into the numbered line and if then they shine from there then we'll pull them out we'll compare them to anything else that we've got and if they're unique then they'll go for naming and then the whole what we're going to name it is the next part of the story i think more recently we've been calling it after our friend calling him for our friends and things like that so it sounds as if they might be fairly easy for people who want to try breeding them at home you can breed them at home dib 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 dab 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 and you've got to get the pollen from the one and put it onto the other and you need sort of wind free um environment for them otherwise the pollen might have come from another one but um and then if he got seed he then pop that up you the seed is ripe and ready immediately it comes out of the seed pod you mustn't dry it or do any anything to it but plant it because it, it it's it's ready to rock and roll right away it produces a little rootlet and then you pop it into a nice seed bed and then you probably won't see it for a year because it'll bury itself down into into the pot. And then in the second year, it might throw up a little leaf. And then in the third year, you'll have a bulblet or a, quite a little bulb. Um, some of the Dutch can have worked out how to force them to get the size. But what's interesting is we've got plants in the glass house that we've had in tiny little containers that are sort of two three centimeters square with about three or four centimeters deep and the bulbs will live in there for 10 20 years quite happily they're incredibly robust and the bulbs we have some in the collection that are 50 60 years old some maybe even slightly older than that they they're very very long-lived plants and they like to sit up on the surface of the um, soil generally speaking with about a third of the bulb out of the ground so when smithers was breeding them do you think that possibly m a lot of these came from a few parent plants he had his favorite parent plants yes but none of those came with the collection to him because he had a relatively small glass as greenhouse and what he would do was every year when they flowered he'd have a beauty parade and he'd put all the orange ones together all the pink ones together and he'd compare his new hybrids with those um and if they were any good they went into the collection and the worst one of what he had before would be thrown away or given away you know, he was a fanatical collector of, of, of the plants. 
Um, but the majority of his stock started as 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 Exbury, and he'd bought a few as a young man and had them with him. And when obviously you've grown them from seed, and they're, they're then presumably the bulbs will bulk up, and you can split them in that way. Yes, they take a, they take a bit of time to bulk up. Some some bulk up very quickly, um, but others split down quite slowly. But you can increase the numbers quite quickly by cutting them up, the bulbs. And as long as you've got a little bit of the base plate on on that, and then you put them into bags filled with perlite, and within three months or so, the little babies will have grown around the edge of the of, of, of the cut the cut slice. And thus you can replicate fairly quickly, but we don't we don't worry about that. We have some uh, some old boy who does it for us. Um, but we don't do that commercially because you end up with just hundreds and hundreds and we're not a commercial operation. We're a private collection that we like to show off. Where are they from originally? South Africa. They come from the Cape province. You know, originally they found them on Table Mountain and that's how they got to Europe was from a... Dutch East Indiaman that had stopped off in the Cape and had picked up um, Dutch people and one of them was carrying a box of bulbs because these were, you know, they were real money in the in those days. The first Noreens that we know of were on sale in Paris in the 1630s or so and we know that a Cromwellian general called Honest John Lambert had them in his collection or had some in his collection. And after the Civil War, he was exiled to Guernsey because he had wisely not signed Charles I's death warrant. All those who had signed Charles I's death warrant met a grisly end. But he got exiled to Guernsey. And we think that he'd taken his collection of bulbs and plants with him because we know he was also visited in Guernsey by his daughters. But the other story goes that the box of bulbs that were picked up in South Africa on this East Indiaman um, grounded in a nasty storm on Guernsey's beaches. And the jurat of Guernsey, Mr. Samares, rescued the passengers off the ship and they were grateful for having had their lives saved and gave him these box of bulbs as a present. And um, from then on in, the Nareen Sarniensis, which was... They thought in those days that it, the bulbs had come from Japan. They didn't know they'd come from... And... They got named Sarniensis after Guernsey and Noreen after a sea naiad, one of the little sea sea maidens. But whether the whether 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 this story was made up um, to cover up the fact that they nicked Honest John's bulbs because he was then sent to Portland, um, and when his daughters went to try and retrieve his bulb collection. They got told it didn't exist anymore. <laughs> so, so there could be skullduggery, but nobody, nobody knows. <laughs> and was there ever a kind of Noreen craze, like there was a tulip craze? Were they particularly fashionable at any point? Well, yes. I mean, people like my grandfather were, were was a big collector of Noreens. He he had great fun. He hybridised loads of them, but he never got to the level of sophistication that Smithers did. Smithers had a much more sophisticated eye and he developed the crinkle, the sparkle and the round head of the of, of the flower with multiple florets in. This was his his um he really did very well. And what is the cause of the sparkle? And the cause of the sparkle, I know the answer to that. No one else does. Except my daughter, who looked at the petal of a Noreen under an electron microscope when she was at Leeds University. 
And what she found was that the surface of the flower, each cell was angled at a different angle and that the surface was reflective. And so the sunlight or whatever bounces off and as you move your head, so you will see the reflection from one of the different cells and that's how they come about. But what makes the reflection golden or what makes a reflection silver um that comes from sort of further within within the cell it's uh the flower itself but the orangey colored ones tend to be golden and the white and pink ones tend to be silver and when you're breeding them i'm assuming then some don't sparkle as much as others that uh, is is uh, they all seem to sparkle now well i think the species sparkles the ones you have, they need to be grown under glass, the Sarniensis. Well, yes, it's, it's simple. You can grow them outside, and, but you've got to keep them dry in the summer because the bulb goes dormant. It, it, the leaves die in April and go yellow, and you take those off, and then the bulb keeps its roots going until the end of July, the beginning of August. It then shrivels those roots... And at the beginning of September, or late in August, depending if they've had a little bit of water or not, they grow a completely new set of roots. And what we also have found is that they grow best in plastic pots. They love plastic pots because the root is better developed. In a clay pot, they seek the moisture off the surface of the clay and they put more energy into growing roots where they don't need to, whereas in plastic, um, they grow a better, a better root system that is adequate for the bulb to produce the flowers, but doesn't lose energy trying to seek more water. Because you need to water them about once every week or two weeks you need to have a well draining compost we use john in his three levington's john in his three he said advertising on the basis that that seems to have the most open um and gritty makeup and they like open and gritty free draining and i'm assuming that's similar for the hardy ones as well they they like free draining yes but they grow their leaves in the summer these only grow their leaves in the winter because they come from a winter rainfall, where the Bowden eyes come from summer or all year rainfall in the Drakensberg. And do they sparkle? No, not really. Um, the Dutch come often and collect pollen from our marines, which they then breed into Bowden eyes down in Portugal. And they're looking to try and get sparkle and they're looking to try and get other colours involved in the whole performance but they have not yet managed to master other than a dark red i notice you've got some um i'm assuming hardy varieties in your borders outside yes on one side there's bowdenai hybrids of which the best flower seems to be a small one called natasha that seems to be the one that really has proved to be very floriferous Um, But on the other side, we have amarines, amarine belladivas, which are a Dutch hybrid between a belladonna, naked lady, and a baudenai. And they're very successful, big, strong plants. And we've had that bed out there now for four or five years, and it just flowers excellently. They're in the ground all the year round, as are the baudenais. They're in the ground all the year round. I, I kind of associate them with growing at the base of a really dry wall. That's where I yes. often see them. That's what they like. Well, they come, they come from rocky, rocky mountains. That picture over there is a rocky mountain with Bowdenai's underneath it. And we have a clump of Bowdenai in the rock garden here at Exbury, which have been there since my grandfather's day, which is 80 years, 90 years. And they're flowering amazingly this year. Do you have to feed them? These ones, yes, we do. We feed them tomorite, weak tomorite. That seems to 
help them enormously. And we find that you should really pop them on every three years because that produces bigger and better flower heads. And once they've finished flowering, do you, if you're obviously, if you're breeding, you keep the, the flower head for the seed, but if not, would you cut down the flower spike? No, it's quite specific. If you cut them, you have run the danger of virus. So you need to put your scissors into Jay's fluid between cutting. But what you actually, the Dutch tortoise, is you hold the top of the bulb between two fingers and you yank the stalk out and it comes out perfectly. Um, but you wait till it goes dry. And as, as, I, as you say, you know, it'll hold its colour if the seeds are there and then when the seeds are ripe they'll pop out of the seed pod there's usually sort of three or four seeds in each in each pod and then and then you have to plant those immediately because they come ready with their little root and do they suffer from any particular pests and diseases obviously the virus is one they suffer from mealybug the dreaded mealybug We usually put in a systemic bug killer into the watering at the very beginning of the season and that tends to work very well. Otherwise you can dip them with methylated or you can do all sorts of squeezing your little monsters. No, they are, they are a problem, mealybug. How long is the exhibition running for? We started on the 1st of October and we'll be closing it at the 1st of November which by the end, this year I think will be quite full of flower because it seems to be, we thought it was going to be an early season, but it's turned out to be quite a late season. Um, We think that the flowering is triggered by temperature fluctuation in August. You know how some days in August you get those really nice hot days in in the daytime and the nighttime goes down to... 10 or whatever and we reckon if there's a fluctuation of 10 to 15 degrees at night between day and night that tells the bulb it's time to get ready to go because that seems to be the 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 the, the trigger and then the bulbs swell and turn red quite often underneath the 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 skin do they ever skip a year oh yeah no they can be they can be complete monsters with you if (laughs) if they feel like it but the truth is when one flower spike comes up it's already got a second one sitting inside the bulb it'll always have two in the downtime it'll always have two flower buds ready to rock and roll or should do but if you haven't been treating it nicely then it's not going to give you a flower (laughs) i think somebody needs to sign up nick to record audiobooks my feeling is he would be particularly brilliant at narrating Roald Dahl stories. Many thanks to Nick for talking to me about the Noreen collection at Exbury and for showing me around the extensive collection in the glass house. If you can get down to the exhibition, I highly recommend it. And if you can't, the garden is worth a visit at any time of the year. Thank you to you two for listening. Here's Dr Ian Bedford talking about a bug that doesn't confine its activities to the garden. Having friends who are serious arachnophobes, I'm very aware of the anxiety that autumn can bring to families all across the country, since every year it heralds the appearance of large hairy house spiders that usually during the evenings scuttle out from the shadows across the carpet then disappear behind a sideboard, only to reappear a few hours later motionlessly clinging to a curtain or skulking along the arm of a sofa. As we'll all know though, this inherent fear of house spiders is actually quite irrational, since they aren't trying to stalk or harm us, but they're merely the long-legged males searching for an attractive female spider to mate with. However, after two or three weeks, the males mysteriously disappear. So where did they go after their autumnal escapades around our homes? And come to think of it, Where were all those alluring female spiders that they were searching for? Well, it's a fairly simple story, 
but probably not one that our arachnophobic friends and family might wish to know. Over that two to three week period, most of the male spiders would have detected the scent of a newly receptive female, followed it, found her, then mated and died. The mated females will then lie dormant throughout the winter amongst their untidy mat of webbing while well, they'll have been living and growing within our homes for the past two years. Covertly tucked away under furniture, on top of a cupboard, behind a bed, or beneath the floorboards, where they'll have caught and eaten various bugs, such as woodlice and beetles, that inadvertently wander too close. Come spring, the female house spiders become active and start producing a number of silken sacs that they fill with eggs and suspend within and around their webs. When all their eggs have been laid, the females' lives are over and they crawl away and die. After about six weeks, a small hole will appear in each of those egg sacs from which around 50 tiny spiderlings will emerge. These will quickly disperse around our homes to find a suitable place to build their own webs, catch prey, and for the very lucky few, become adult house spiders in two years' time. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign-up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.